Okay, good morning everyone, and Hazak Baru, thank you for joining us on this beautiful <clears throat> uh, Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning, my friends, <coughs> as we are starting together, Perashat Beha'alotecha. Perashat Beha'alotecha has a lot of action. There's a lot going on in our Perasha. And today I would like to study together a very interesting uh, episode in the middle of the Perasha. Please turn to chapter 11. Chapter 11, Perashat Ve'alotecha. If you have a Humash, this is a great time to open it, to follow along. And um, <clears throat> we read how the Jewish people complained. The people complain a lot. They, uh, you know, they're at a stage that Moshe expected them to be mature, that they should know Hashem is going to take care of them. And they complain, they want meat, they want to go back to Egypt. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things that they, they, they're just complaining. And at a certain point, believe it or not, Moshe says, I can't. I can't do it anymore. God, did I give birth? Did I, have, did I raise them? Did I, have, did I become pregnant with them? Why are you giving me this stress, Hashem? I didn't ask to be the leader. I didn't choose this. Why, why are you giving this to me? This is Moshe, believe it or not. I don't know if you ever knew this. Moshe had it. He was done. He couldn't handle being the leader anymore. He said, God, I need help. I need help. And that's, by the way, an amazing lesson. Just that alone, that in life there's no shame in asking for help. Sometimes you can't do it. And you need to know, when I can't do it, I need to hire somebody. I need to have that hand, another set of eyes, another person. There's no shame. I don't have to be the, the guy to do the whole thing. It doesn't have to be me. I could hire. I could ask. I, right? Tovim hashnaim me'ahad. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I can't do it. I need help, please, Hashem. I need help. Right? Lama hareot el Why are you doing such bad things to me? Uh, to make me, I can't. To handle all the complaints alone. I can't do it. Lo uchala anuchi levadi laset et kola amaze. I can't carry them by myself. That's bottom line, Moshe's complaint to God. Vayomer Adonai el Moshe. So God says to Moshe, no problem. Esfali shiv'im ish mezikne Yisrael. Gather 70 men. Asher yadata ki hem zikne ha'am v'shot rav. Gather for me 70 elders. Bring them to the oil mo'ed. V'yit yatzevu sham emach. Let them come with you and stand in the opening of the tent of meeting. V'yarati v'debarati emecha sham. I will come down. V'yatzati min haruah. I will take from the spirit. Asher alecha v'samti alehem and add it to them. Meaning, Moshe, you want help, you got it. I'm going to take from the nevuah, from your prophecy, from your power, and I'm going to spread it to them. Okay? This is beautiful. This is very powerful. To, right? To, to, to be able to give your talent and share it with other people. Okay. <clears throat> so the Pasuk says, all of a sudden, Pasuk 25. God comes in a, in a cloud and he speaks to him. And he does this. God does this. He takes from the power from Moshe and he gives it over to the 70 other people. And once the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do so again. So all of a sudden, these 70 people were able to prophesy. Great. Now, here's our Pasuk for today. You ready? All of a sudden, there were two men who remained behind. One guy's name was Eldad. One guy's name was Medad. Okay, two guys. And the Spirit rested on them. And they were... In the recorded, and they didn't go out to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. And all of a sudden, one of the kids that overhears, he runs and he says to Moshe, And Yehoshua Benun hears that they prophesied, and he says, Moshe, destroy them. And Moshe says, No, it's not a problem, let them prophesy. So on and so forth. The story continues. 
But again, let's just recap the story outside. Moshe, he's had it. So God says, gather 70 men and give them from your power, from your energy. And Moshe does this. He gathers 70. And the Pasuk says that after he did that, two of them, two of them remained and they continued to prophesy. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Ora Hayim today, he's going to share a few questions. And he's going to give an answer at the end. That's My friends, it's worth waiting to the end of this class. Because it's I'm going to give you today, Ora Hayim is going to share with us a big, big, big secret. A secret, a shortcut in life. Shortcut. Listen to what he's going to say over here. He's going to say, I know it's usually no shortcuts. But over here, he's going to give us a shortcut, believe it or not. He says over here, he has obviously a few questions first. To understand this whole story. These two guys, they remained... So he says, Tzarih Ladat, we have to know, number one, what does it mean, Vayisha'aru? Two guys remained. What does it mean, remain? Remained from what? When I say there's a remainder, a remainder from something. Menai Nisha'aru, from where, from what group did they remain? Okay. Number two, Lama Utzrach Le'askir Shemam, why are you telling me their names? Why is that important? Patanach Alehim, number three, it says that the Spirit rested upon them. I said, I don't understand. Were they part of the 70? They weren't part of the 70? If they're part of the 70, then uh, we already know that they got the Spirit of Hashem. It says in the Pasuk before that, that they got the Spirit. So what does it mean that they got the Spirit? And they're not part of the 70, then they shouldn't have gotten Spirit. They're not part of the 70. Omro vehema baketuvim. They were part of the recorded ones. Which recorded? What recorded? What's going on over here? Also, it says they didn't go out. Obviously, they didn't go out if it says that they stayed in the camp. They didn't go out. So, Orahim is he's confused like we are. What's going on over here? Who are these guys? Why are you telling me their names? What does it mean that they remained? Remained from where? Where? Uh, what does it mean that they recorded? Recorded it in what? So, he explains the whole thing over here based on Two possible explanations depending on two opinions in the Gemara. He says, The Mahloket in Masechet Sanhedrin. Listen to the Gemara says. Gemara says as follows. Two opinions. Yesh Omrim, some say, Nish'aru Meshiv'im Ushnaim. That they were a remainder of the 72. What's 72? I thought 70. So listen to what's going on. Barar Moshe mi Israel Shisha Mikol Shevet Beshave. Originally, Moshe, how do you get 70 elders? How do you pick 70? There's a lot of people. How do you get from 600,000 to 70? So Moshe had to pick 12, to be fair, from 12 tribes. What's the math? 12 times 6 is how much? 72. So if you get 6 guys from every tribe, you'll have 72 elders. Now God said 70. So you're going to have two left over. So what did Moshe do? He grilled. He did a lottery. He took 72 people, but he only took 70, um, only 70 pieces, pieces of paper had uh, the winning ticket. Okay? So there were 72 people, but only 70 were picked. And at the end of it all, 70 elders out of the 72 were picked, and two are going to be left out. And these two guys, Eldad and Medad, you know who they are? They're the ones left over that didn't get picked. That's one opinion. They didn't make the cut. Second opinion says, no, they did make the cut. They were of the 70. So what does it mean that they remained outside? If they made it, they should come in with the 70. You, you have the golden ticket. You're invited to the chocolate factory. Yeah? You made it in. You, you could come in and see Willy Wonka. You could enter the palace. You could come in into Hashem. You, may, you enter the Mishkan. You won. You have the winning ticket. So you should be part of the 70. But, says Rabbi Shimon, Lo ratzuli kanes, letzad anava veshiflut. Because of their humility, they didn't want to go in. They stayed outside. 
going in, it's like, ah, how are you? I got picked. Hazaku Baruch, Shabbat Shalom, Hak Sameach. They didn't want to show that they were important, that they were arrogant. They thought it would make them inflated ego. So they stayed outside. They stayed outside. You know, we find many great people like this. Shaul HaMelech, you should know. Shaul HaMelech was a very humble guy. Shaul HaMelech, when he was before king, when he was picked to be the king, you know, you hear how humble he was. He one day, what happened? He lost his donkeys, whatever, and then he bumps into the Navi Shemuel. And Shemuel says, listen kid, you're going to be the first king of the Jewish people. Shaul's like, what are you talking about? I'm not the guy. He's like, no, you're the guy who can be the first king. He went home, and his uh, dad said, where were you? And he said, you know, what would you say if your dad said, where were you? Right? He said, well, me? I was picked to be the king. You don't know who I just met. But Shaul didn't say any of that. Shaul said, oh yeah, I lost my donkeys. I was carried away, sorry. He didn't even tell him that he was picked. That's how humble Shaul was. When they inaugurated Shaul, when they were, uh, you know, crowning him, when they were, you know, welcoming him, they couldn't find him. He was hiding with the luggages, with the baggage of the people. That's how humble Shaul was. Shaul, you know, great people. There's humility. Now, it's interesting because at the end, we know what happened with Shaul. The kavod got to him. The honor, the honor, you should know, Ramchal, Mesilat Yisharim says about honor, is the most dangerous temptation. It's the biggest drive of a human being. More than money is honor. The reason we want money is because we know the money will lead to honor. People will spend a lot of money to get honor. A guy will give millions away because he'll get honor back. So people and honor is what drives the world crazy. People, they stress their whole family. They, they, they work more than necessary to make a lot more money than they need. Because of honor. Because I have to fit in. What will people say? I have to own a certain car. I have to live in a certain block. I have to vacation a certain amount of times a year. I have to keep up. Because if I don't, we're going to be Hazit case. What will people say about us? The whole community is going to know. And, da, da, da. and so people end up ruining their marriages. They destroy their happiness. They, people, people spend a summer in houses that they don't really want to be in. Because we have to. This is where everyone goes. And if, even if we can't afford it, they'll go into debt, they'll steal, they'll borrow, they'll, they'll destroy everything, they'll sell. Because honor, because ego, you have to fit in. You should know ego is a very, very, very big temptation. It's a temptation that lasts till the day you die. A young guy, he's tempted with immorality, with lust. An older guy doesn't have lust. When you get a certain age, the lust goes away, right? You don't have the temptation for those things. But honor, it doesn't matter how old you are. Opposite. The older you get, the more honor you want. The more kavod hits you, right? So ego, we have to realize, is a very big temptation. Very dangerous. And even Shaul, as humble as he was, Eventually, he got to his head. And at the end of his life, he ended up chasing David HaMelech to kill him. Because he was afraid that David's going to take his throne. He was afraid that David's going to take his position. And people in life, because of Kavor, they'll do the worst things. People destroy marriage. They destroy friendships. They destroy relationships. Because they don't have the humility to apologize, to say sorry, People throw away everything because they can't just uh, be happy with a little bit, happy with, with just being average. They need to be on the top. And if I'm not going to be on top, I don't want any of it. I don't want anything. It's either my way or the highway. How many times we could help, but we know that our input, it's not going to be done the exact way we want it. If it's going to be 80%, 70%, 40%, 30%. So what do we say? Okay, you know what? You don't want to listen to me? Bye! Bye! Do it on your own! Do it on your own! Go ahead! Ah, it's okay! I don't mind. I'm not angry! I'm not angry! You just do it by yourself! Good luck to you! It's fine! Just do it! You want to do it? You do it! And then we don't help because we're not going to be 100% listened to. That, that is kavod. That's arrogance. 
That comes from ego. It's got to be either, either you listen to me because you value me. I'm right or no. But uh, you can only take 10% of what I have to say. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. So yeah, you take the keys. You run with the project. Go ahead. Hazaka Baruch. Go do it your way. Leave me alone. That's a guy's, that's ka'ava. So arrogance, very, very big temptation. If you want to study more on this, by the way, read Mesilat Yesharim. End, end, end of chapter 11. Unbelievable. He gives examples. People that threw away their lives. People that threw away opportunity. The biggest, you could have the most amazing life. And people throw it away because of a little bit of ego. A little bit of ego. To humble yourself a little bit. Okay. So you're not going to be the top. You're going to be number two. He gives an example. There was once a guy, his name was Yerovaam ben Nevat. Yerovaam, when there was a civil war and a split in the kingdoms, Yerovaam went, he became the king of the upper kingdom, the northern kingdom. And uh, eventually he did very bad sins. He set up statues. He said to the Jews, bow down to these. This is your God. They took you out of Egypt. Like crazy things that, are, that you would think a Jew would never say. Times like, things like really like Heta Egel. And he was Mahti Arabim. That means the worst sin. That you cause people to sin. Not just you sin, but you say to other people, come sin with me. That's the worst sin you could do, by the way. It's one thing if you want to mess up your own life. But to now be a bad influence, that's the worst. That's what Yerovam was. The Gemara says that God came to Yerovam and He gave him an opportunity of a lifetime. He said, Yerovam, I'll make you a deal. You say sorry now, and I'll take you private tour me, you, and David Melech in Gan Eden, private, in my helicopter, God says. Wow. Wow. What do I have to do? Just say sorry. Okay. Dirovam had one question. He said, God, I'm, I'm ready. One question. Me, Barosh, who's sitting shotgun? Who's sitting in the front seat? God said, David Barosh. David's shotgun. He's Mashiach. He's Yehuda. Yerovam said, then in that case, no thank you. I'll pass. I'll stay here in Gehenam. I'd rather be Gehenam, the king of the palace, than to be second in Gan Eden. I don't want to be second. No thank you. I'll pass, God. Look how crazy. Now you think Yerovam is, is nuts. Yerovam is not... We all, ha- we, all ha- we all do that a little bit on our own level. We all have a little bit of Yerovam. We have an opportunity to have a beautiful experience. But it's going to require being second. I won't be the top. I'll be second. Have second nicest, second best. No, no, thank you. I'm not interested. No. No. If you're not going to give me the best room in the house, you gave it to my sister. Why would you give her the room? Why not me? You don't appreciate us enough. You like her more. You know what? We're not coming for the summer. I'd rather stay miserable in the uh, locked up apartment in the city than being second place in a beautiful mansion on the ocean. Not interested. No thank you. No thank you. So you, you laugh at Yerovam, but realize we all do this in our lives. How many people, they, they destroy their career. Because of a little bit of ego, a little bit of ga'ava. So over so here, Ora Haim is saying, these two guys, these two guys, they, they were such a lo- level of humility that although they were picked, they were part of the 70, 70 people. They had a winning ticket. But on their level, they knew that going in would blow their head up a little bit. It would inflate the ego. They said, we're staying outside. We're not going in. So these are the two opinions in the Gemara. One rabbi says that they, were, they, were, they didn't make the cut. They were the two remaining of the 72. And one rabbi says, no, they were part of the 70 that made it. Now we have to analyze each one. The one that says that they were part of the 70. So the pasuk is saying, So the pasuk is saying that there were 70. And of those 70, now you go back and read the pasuk. Two remained from those 70. And why did they stay outside? Because they viewed themselves of little significance. They said we were not important. 
we don't really deserve to be of the 70. It was humility. And, and, and then it tells us their names. Why does it tell us their name? It tells us their name for a very important reason. You know, humility has a place and a time. And sometimes humility, if it's used in the wrong place, actually it's a chilul Hashem. Believe it or not. I'll give you an example. Let's say you, uh, you invite a guy to open the hechal. You open a guy to, to read the Torah, to be hazan, to come and do something nice. You, 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 you have someone important. You say, come, why don't you host, host a class in your house? They say, no, no, I don't want to show off. I don't want to show off. <laughs> I don't want to show off. The guy built a mansion. He said, I don't want to show off. I don't want to show off. So what did you build a mansion for? Right? So person that's humble, sometimes that humility, if it's misplaced, it actually leads to chilul Hashem. People see that you're not running to do good. People see that you're not going to help, that you're not going to pray, you're not going to learn. Actually, it creates in people's mind, they start wondering and they're suspicious. Why is he not going? He's, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't think praying is important. He doesn't want to be hazan. He doesn't want to get an aliyah. Aliyah, right? I can tell you, you know, a lot of times, especially with younger kids, you invite a kid go up to be aliyah. No, 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 I got, I got seven years ago. I'm good. I don't need an aliyah. Thank you. I got it by my mitzvah. Hazak baruch. Thank you. <laughs> It's unbelievable. So that's a chilul Hashem. Because if I said, here, come, please, we need you to take a half-court shot in basketball. Half-court shot. Please, come. You wouldn't say, no, 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 I'm humble. I don't want to go up. You would say, yes, come, pick me. I want to go. I want to be the guy to be picked. I want to go dribble the ball. I want an opportunity to, to score from the foul line in the NBA court. Halftime show. Right? Over there, you didn't, you didn't say, I'm humble, I don't want to go. What, all of a sudden, now you're humble? So humility, when it's for mitzvah, it can be dangerous. Depends why, right? Are you really humble? Or you just don't like the mitzvah, you don't care about mitzvah? If, if you're not really a humble, usually, if you're not a humble person, if always in life you're the type of guy that you run and you want to be picked and you like attention, and you like big things, and you like nice things, right? If you throw a party, and you're throwing $100,000 to $100,000 party, then it can't be that when you're doing a mitzvah, right, all of a sudden, you go cheap. You can't say when it comes to a mitzvah, uh, here, come, we want someone to put a plaque. We want someone to put a plaque for, for the Torah center. You want to sponsor a plaque? We'll put your name. Say, no, no, I don't want name. I don't like attention. You don't like attention? What are you talking about? You don't like attention. You drive a very, a very expensive car that draws a lot of attention. <laughs> you build a house that draws a lot of attention. You, you put your stuff out there on social media to draw a lot of attention. You love attention. Don't say you don't like attention. You are Mr. Attention. All of a sudden, by a mitzvah, you don't want attention? That's not real humility. That's a lie. You're lying to yourself. Really deep down, it's a chilul Hashem. Really, you, don't, you just don't want to support Torah. Really, you just don't want to help this important cause. That's really, you, you're lying when you say it's, it's humility. It's fake humility. So when Eldadu Medad are invited in, come, please join us in the 70 people meeting, special meeting. They say, no, 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 we don't want, we don't want. That could be, that could be either humble, but it could also be lying. How do you know? How do you know if it's lying or not? So the pasuk has to come and say, by the way, these two guys, they were big guys. They were Eldad and Medad, and everyone knew them. They were not small, average, average people. They were top level people. So when they say no thank you, it's really because that's who they really are. They're really humble all the time, through and through. This is how they live their personal lives. This is how they always are with everybody in their life. <clears throat> they're, um, they're humble. And they're, therefore, it's consistent to be humble over here. They didn't want the attention. Okay, I understand. They didn't want the attention. Because otherwise, to just show humility, when really you love attention, when you love the spotlight, when you love with physical things, with materialistic things, with social things, you're the center of attention. You're always the loudest. You always ask. You always want to be seen. You always want to be the one in the middle talking, spreading, leader, 
right? Directing. All of a sudden, now when it comes to good mitzvot, you don't you, you don't want you don't want to be involved. Why? What happened? Well, is it really humility, or is it maybe you just uh, you don't you just don't value this? You just don't value this. Okay. So this is all one approach. That these two guys remain, and they were in written. They were written. They were there. Part of the parchment. Part of the seventy. Part of the ketuvim. And the order Hayim, you can read it yourself. He says this answers all the questions that we asked before. But there is another approach, like we said, that they didn't make the 70. They were actually the two that didn't make the cut. They were part of the 72. The other two guys. So the Pasuk is saying, Vayisha'aru. Hagam shenisha'aru anashim. Even though these two guys remained. That's what it means, remained. The first approach is that they remained outside. They didn't follow the 70 in, even though they should have. Here it's saying, no, they remained from the 72, they were the leftovers. And still, the Pasuk says, Vatana Halehem Aruah. But still, they got prophecy. And the question is, why? How? The question is, if they weren't part of the 70, all these 70 guys got prophecy that day. How come all of a sudden these two guys also got? What happened special that all of a sudden they received Nevuah? And here's my friends, the bomb for today's class, the gift that I'm going to give you. Take what I'm telling you now, write this down for the rest of your life. Never forget this, okay? A shortcut order Haim is giving. He says, Ulai she katuv, she hashnaim she lo yatu babtakim. Pasuk maybe is teaching us here that the two guys who did not emerge from the lottery, nichlemu. They were embarrassed because they were rejected. And therefore, they went to the rest of the camp. And they stayed with the regular people while the elders were being inaugurated. But that's in contrast to what all the rest of the Jewish people did. For they all went out to assemble around the Ohel Moed. Everyone over there at the party is very happy. Everyone's excited to hear who's the new 70 leaders. But out of everyone, 600,000 people... Two of them were not, two of them were right now, they were ashamed. 600,000 happy, excited to hear who the 70 are, to see them. But there's two, the ones that didn't make the 70. They were embarrassed, they were hurt. They, they could have been, they should have been, they would have been, and they weren't picked. And they were ashamed that they didn't, they didn't reach the level, that they were up to par, that they were able to receive prophecy. They hid in the camp. Now look at this, you ready? Look at this order Hayim right now. One line. Vayar Hashem Boshtam. Hashem saw their embarrassment. Uchlimatam and Neshem. Vayitna Be'u. And so God, out of pity, when a person is rejected, Hashem gave them prophecy anyways. And that's what it means. That even though they weren't picked, they weren't part of the team, but they were embarrassed, God says, all right, you know what, come. You're in. That means that in life, my friends, there's two ways to make it to the top. There's two ways to get something. One way is that you're picked. Picked means you work on yourself. You're tzaddik. You work. You go. You reach the top. And then God says, okay, you're picked. Come with me. I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you a prophecy. I'm going to give you a bracha. I'm going to give you children. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you a marriage. I'm going to give you a beautiful house. I'm going to give you health. I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you a good business. I'm going to give you life, the best things that life has to offer. Right? Some people in life, they're picked because they're part of the 70. That's one way to reach the top. That's a very hard way. You got to really work. You got to keep Shabbat. You got to keep kosher. That's, that's the way to get it. And that's, by the way, that's the, that's the right way. That's how you get to the top. And then, Ora Haim saying, but there is another way. Sometimes we're trying, but it's not good enough. So God gives us a gift. You know what the gift is called? It's a shortcut. It's called getting embarrassed. Hashem gives us an opportunity. I know I'm saying a word that sounds weird, but I'm saying opportunity. God gives you an opportunity on a silver platter. He gives you, someone embarrassed you. He gives you a gift called you were embarrassed. You get ashamed. Someone said something on the Shabbat table. And now you're face, you're humiliated. You can't even look. You need to run out of the room. You need to leave. Says the Ora Haim, in that moment, in that space, 
When you're embarrassed, you can reach the top. God sees your pain. You pray for anything that you want. You get to the top. You get the prophecy that you wanted, that you really don't deserve because you weren't picked. But you get it anyways. God says, come, come, I'll give it to you. Yalla, let's go. You don't deserve it, but you're embarrassed. Come. And this is the, my friends, this is the shortcut to life. A shortcut to success. The Gemara says, Bo ure kama gedola ko hashel busha. Come and see how powerful, how powerful it is when you get embarrassed in life. It's the most powerful thing when you get embarrassed. I know we don't ask to be embarrassed and don't ask, don't ask for this test. But realize, realize that if you were ever ashamed, there is so much bracha waiting for you on the other side. If you could take it, if you could bite your tongue, if you could not answer back, just the fact that you were ashamed, you now have the keys Whatever you want, God will, God will give you blessing. Even if you want to do something bad. Even if you're a bad guy. If you're a bad guy, you want to do the wrong thing. But you are embarrassed, God will allow you bracha in your, in your journey. He'll allow you to succeed in your, in your endeavors. Because you were embarrassed. That alone already takes you. It's like a boost. It pushes you to the finish line. Gemara says as an example, who is a great example of this? Gemara says, Story of Bar Kamsa. Remember that story? Gemara says, I'll tell you the story quickly. Masech Gitin, page 57. Gemara says that there was a uh, fellow, he had a party, and uh, he hosted this party. He sent to the wedding planner, to the party planner, he sent them an invitation list. The party planner made a mistake, and by mistake, inviting he invited instead of a guy by the name of Kamta, he invited a guy by the name of Bar Kamta. Okay, Bar Kamta, you would think, okay, it's a minor mistake. But for this guy, for the host, it was a big deal. Because the host loved Kamta, but he hated Bar Kamta. So all of a sudden, at his party, who shows up? Bar Kamta. He says, what in the world are you doing at my party? Get out of here. Bar Kamsa, like, what do you mean? I was invited. Here's the invitation. Look, I have my name, table 32. I'm right here. I'm, I'm in the list. He said, well, I don't know. It was a mistake. Get up and get out. He said, right, listen, listen, listen. Don't make a scene, please. Everyone's watching. I'll pay for my portion, okay? Just let me eat, and I'll get up in five minutes. I'll leave, okay? He's like, no. Get up now and get out of here. He's like, all right, listen, 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 listen. I'll pay you for half the party, okay? Please, just don't embarrass me. He's like, no, get up and, and get out. He's like, listen, please, please, please. I'll pay you for the whole thing. Now, between me and you, <laughs> I don't care how much you hate the guy. If a guy's willing to pay for the whole party, you know, you could be my best friend. You know what I mean? But either way, this guy said, get out of the party. He takes him, he picks him up, and he starts dragging him out of the party. And as he's being dragged out, you can imagine how embarrassed he is, how humiliated he is. And he gets thrown outside, and he says to himself, I don't believe it. The rabbis, the, the leaders of the community were all there. They all saw him throwing me out. Not one of them tried to stop him. That's it. I'm going to show those rabbis. I'm going to show those Jews. And he goes to the Caesar and he speaks gossip to the Caesar. And he says, you know, the Jews rebelled against you. They don't want you. They, 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 they don't love you anymore. He's like, what are you talking about? The Jews respect me. He's like, no, look, bring a sacrifice. See if they even accept it from you. So he sends a sacrifice with this guy Bar Kamta. And Bar Kamta, on the way to the Beit HaMikdash, he secretly, he makes a cut in the lip of the animal. Now that animal is blemished, you're not allowed to bring it to the Beit HaMikdash as a korban, usually for God. The rabbis, they get the animal, they see the cut. They thought maybe we should still bring it anyways because it's for the Caesar. Long story short, they ended up not bringing the korban. And at the end of the day, the Caesar heard... And he came and he destroyed the Beit HaMikdash. And the Gemara says one line, Masih HaGitin, kama gedola kohashel busha. Come and see how great is the power of shame. Shehare siya gedosh baruchu et bar kamsa. Because God came and assisted bar kamsa, who was humiliated because he was thrown out of this party. Veherive et beto. And God who allowed, he even allowed bar kamsa in his plan to destroy the temple. Vesarav et echalot to burn the sanctuary. That's what this guy wanted to do. This guy, not a tzaddik, Bar Kamsa. You're talking about a really low guy. Here's a guy that's a moser, you could probably call him. 
He is a guy that's ready to squeal on Jewish people. This is one of the worst guys in Judaism. There's a bracha in the Amidah just for a guy like him, to, to, for God to destroy guys like that. Laminim, velamalshinim, velamosrim, some add. Al tikva. Whistleblowers. Worst guy, worst guy. Gemara says, guy, you could, you could do whatever you want, you, whatever is needed to stop him. Dangerous guy. Squealing on people. Now again, halachically speaking today, it's an interesting question, who is considered a squealer? How far is squealing? What if a guy's job works for the IRS? A lot of interesting questions. If he's a Jew, it's legal. It's, uh, they're not going to kill you today. There's courts, there's democracy. So usually back then, a squealer, what happened is that you would get killed because the governments were anti-Semitic. There was no real democracy. It wasn't a just system. It was just a dictator. So back then, squealer meant you died. Today, interesting, different, it's complicated. But my point is, this guy back then, Bar Kamsa, couldn't have been a good guy. Couldn't have been a good guy. That you're squealing on the Jewish people. I think we could all agree of us, today we could all agree, he's a Rasha. Yes? You agree? This guy, Bar Kamsa, he's a Rasha. And still the Gemara says, God came and helped him, because he was ashamed. Because he was humiliated. So what does that teach us, my friends, about power of shame? And this is what the Orahim is saying. Orahim is saying, there's two ways in life to make it to the top. You could be part of the 70. You have your own success train. And then there's the train called humiliation. It's a second train. When you miss the first train, right? And we know the Perashah is all about second chances. The Perashah speaks about Pesach Sheni. It's about guys that couldn't do the first Pesach, so now they try to do the second Pesach. So you see the theme of our Perashah, Behalot is about second chances, second ways, other ways, alternatives to the top, an alternative to success. Our Perashah is saying, you, want, you know what's an alternative? You want an alternative? I'll give you an alternative. It's called being ashamed. When, you, when you're ever there, if you ever get there, if you're ever in a situation, and I know it's the worst situation. I don't know if you were ever embarrassed. Worst feeling. You just want to you you want to you want to jump off a building, right? Being embarrassed, my friends, there's nothing worse in life. People, people really commit suicide because of humiliation. So Torah says, if you're ever in that spot, you have a golden opportunity. You are being gifted by God. A, a, a direct. Elevate it to the top. If you want it, you walk in. You take it. You shut your mouth. You don't answer back. You don't respond. You don't even say, you know, I could respond, but I'm not gonna. Even that, you know, you know, don't say that. And you enter, my friends, you walk into that elevator. And you shoot to the top. You become part of the 70. You weren't invited. You didn't have a golden ticket. What are you doing here? Yeah, but I was embarrassed. So, I'm here. And I'm here to stay. Koha shel busha. The power of shame, my friends. The power of shame. Hashem should bless us to never, ever have to uh, turn to this alternative route. We should always really, really, we should always grow to the top from our own strength by working on ourselves, by becoming part of the 70. But sometimes, for some reason, there's a block there's a block, even though we're trying. Sometimes there's a block that we don't deserve whatever we're praying for. So to remember in those moments that if we're ever tested with humiliation, that Hashem should give us the strength, the courage, the power, the wisdom to remember this idea of the Ora Hayim. Because Hashem, we will see all the blessings coming our way. Okay, we'll stop over here, my friends. Have a wonderful day, and hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.